Hi everyone, my name is Rohan Singh Poona and welcome back to my channel. In this video, we'll be looking into how to compare algorithms. How to compare algorithms? Along with that, we'll look into asymptotic notations. Let's say, again, we have two people. Uh, let's say one is Batman and one is Superman. Now, Batman being rich or being Bruce Wayne, uh, let's say has a lot of money and uh, has a very high-end system. Let me draw his system. So, Batman has a high-end system, let's say, which has 16 GB of RAM, 1 TB of SSD, and a lot of features, you know, like here and there. And let's say have multiple processors, multiple processors or cores, let's say has a high-end graphic card and so on. But on the other hand, Superman has a system or a laptop which has, let's say, 2 GB of RAM, 256 GB of HDD, the hard disk drive and some minor features along with that, let's say, has a single processor, single core processor uh, maybe a really old one somewhere like uh, Intel Pentium, you can say. And some other minor features, right? Now, let's say Batman comes up with an algorithm to sort uh, numbers uh, using, uh, let's say, bubble sort. Now, his algorithm, when he tries to run on his machine, runs at a very high speed and, you know, he is able to sort the numbers very fast. But on the other hand, when Superman also comes up with the same algorithm on his own and tries to run the algorithm on his machine, his algorithm takes a bit extra time to sort the numbers. So can we say that Batman's algorithm is better than Superman? That's absolutely a no. So therefore, here we had a hardware. We had, basically Batman had a better hardware or like high RAM, right? Similarly, it might have, uh, you know, he had a better SSD and Pat Superman had an SDD. So reading and writing speed, you know, might again vary, right? Reading and writing speed might vary as he has SSD and he has HDD. Therefore, hardware cannot be a good metric for analyzing both of the algorithms. Similarly, reading and writing speed you know, can also be not a good metric for comparison of algorithms. Similarly, they might have a different operating system. Let's say Batman is using an operating system which is running on 64-bit, which is a 64-bit operating system. And on the other side, let's say Superman is using a 32-bit operating system. So these cannot be a good metric for analyzing their algorithms' performance. So what can be a good metric for analyzing their performance of the algorithms? So it's nothing but the input size. It's nothing but the input size. So now, what we are interested in is nothing but we want to see how the algorithm performs for different set of inputs. Or you can say when the input size keeps on increasing. Let's say we have input 1. And let's say the Batman's algorithm takes, let's say, maybe uh, one second to run the algorithm for this input. On the other hand, let's say Superman's algorithm takes five seconds for that particular input. And now let's say if we increase the input size, let's say now we have an input two, which is bigger than the input one. Let's say Batman's algorithm, you know, jumps to 10 seconds and Superman's algorithm, let's say, jumps to 100 seconds. So what we are basically interested in is nothing but that how their algorithms perform for different set of inputs and this can be the correct metric for analyzing their algorithms correct metric which is nothing but the rate of growth rate of growth so maybe i can define it like this that the rate at which the rate at which running time increases as a function of input size. It 
which is nothing but as we keep on increasing the input size, how much time their algorithms keep taking for different sets of input. That is nothing but the rate of growth of their time. Now, therefore, we need to also keep aside the computer specification and also any programming language, right? Because as different programming languages might have different number of statements to perform a set of operations. Maybe for additions, let's say, uh, one particular particular language might take two statements and uh, internally for uh, multiplication in the other language, it might take, let's say, four statements. So therefore, uh, we have to keep aside computer specification. We also have to keep aside the consideration of programming language. And that's why we define an idle machine. So that's why we tend to define an idle machine, which is nothing but, let's try to define an idle machine. Let's say, the ideal machine has a single processor, let's say it also has a 64-bit operating system, 64-bit modes, and let's say the arithmetic operations, the arithmetic operations let's say, or single operations, any single operations, let's say to print or to take input operation takes, let's say, one unit of time, one unit of time. Therefore, let's say addition, subtraction, let's say multiplication or division, we are assuming it takes one second of time. Division takes one unit of time. So this is what we are defining as an idle machine. Now we will consider that Batman as well as Superman has this machine, right? Everyone in the world has this machine and many people also call this as a model machine. If you go through any books or if you try to learn time complexities, a lot of places they are mentioning this like a model machine. So now once we consider a model machine, then we can actually compare their algorithms and we can compare how much time it keeps taking for different size of inputs. And that is going to be a fair comparison for comparing their algorithms. Now let's try to calculate running time for some sample code snippets. Let's take an example. Let's say we have a code, uh, something called as sum, in which we are trying to add these two numbers. Now let's say this method does nothing but it returns a plus b. That's it, right? So now if we try to compute the time, you know, that this particular code might take, right? It's going to be, as we said in the model machine, every operation takes one unit of time. So here, this particular a plus b is going to take one unit of time. And then this particular a plus b is the sum that we are trying to return. So this also going to take one unit of time. So totally the code will take two units of time. Now, if we change the input, let's say, you know, while running the algorithm, if we change the value of A, if we change the value of B, or if we keep changing the input for this particular piece of code, is the time taken going to change? It's a no. I mean, it will not change. So ideally, if we see this particular code, then it's going to take constant time, which is nothing but two unit of time every time, irrespective of whatever input we tend to pass to it, right? Therefore, as we said that, we are interested in the rate of growth of time as a function of input size. So if we try to draw or, you know, plot the rate of growth in this particular case for this code snippet, then we can say y-axis is the time taken or the time axis and let's say the x-axis is here for the input size. Now we know that irrespective of the input size, the time taken is going to stay at, let's say this one unit, let's say this is a two unit. It's going to stay at two unit. Even if you keep changing the input, it's still going to be two unit, which is nothing but a constant. Right? Now let's jump on to another example. Let's say, let's say this time we are trying to find sum of, let's say sum of numbers. 
we have set of numbers and we are trying to find the sum of numbers. Let's say we have an array A with n numbers and we are trying to find the sum of these n numbers. So let's see how the code snippet looks like. Let's say we have a variable called as sum which is initially 0 and then we are running a loop starting with let's say i equals to 0, i less than n, i plus plus which is gonna run from i to n minus 1 and let's say here we are doing sum equals to sum plus a of i and let's say we are returning sum at the end. So now if we observe this particular code then if we try to calculate the time taken in this case let's say let's say time and uh, okay let's say time and the number of times this statement is gonna get executed number of time executed now we know that this particular line here sum equals to zero is gonna take one unit of time and how many times this gonna this line is gonna get executed only once now if we actually look at this particular line which is a complex statement right what is happening in this line is nothing but we are initializing this i to zero which happens only once right this happens only once and then we are comparing or we are actually checking whether i is less than or less than n or not that is nothing but it's a conditional statement then we are incrementing the value of i so basically there are this is going to happen only once so i can say that this is going to take one unit of time plus we have two major statements here which is i less than n and i plus plus this is going to keep happening how many times it's going to happen n plus one times we we'll look into why n plus one times and both of them are going to happen n plus one times which is nothing but 2n plus 1. Okay, so this is not uh, the number of time executed, but this is something how many times, uh, how much time does it take, right? So the comparison conditional statement takes one unit of time, also the increment takes one unit of time. Now, if we actually see the number of times it is being executed, is nothing but is executed n plus 1 times. But this one new statement is only executed one time. So let's say, let me write it down here one new for initialization, it, takes, it, it happens only one time which is for i equals to 0 and this 1u plus 1u is nothing but for the conditional and the increment statement. Now if we try to look into the next line which is nothing but sum equals to sum plus a of i it's nothing but we are adding these two numbers and then we are assigning this here. So ideally this is going to take two unit of time as we have two operations and how many times this thing will happen? This thing will happen n times. Now if we look into this particular statement return sum is going to take how much time? One unit of time as it's only a single operation and it will only be executed once. So can I say that the total time taken by this program is going to be the time taken to execute that statement into the number of time it is being executed and the sum of all of these statements that that's going to run. So I can write it down like this. Let's say I can simply multiply these two and add. Multiply these two and add. I need to add all of it. So if I actually try to do a sum of all of these, then I'm gonna get for the first line one u plus again one u plus it's gonna be two u two unit of time into n plus one plus again two unit of time into n plus one unit of time. If we actually see here, it's gonna be one unit of time, one unit of time, one unit um, unit of time. This is gonna be three unit of time plus 2 unit of time into n plus 1 n plus 1 plus 2 unit of time into n right now if you open the brackets we are going to get 2 unit extra so it's going to be 5 unit of time plus 2 unit times n plus 2 unit times n so this is going to be 4 unit n or we can say 4 n plus 5 unit of time So this much time is going to take, this particular code is going to take this much of time. So now the time, we can say that the time to find sum of numbers is nothing but 4n plus 5 unit of time for this particular code. Now let's say if we want to plot even this particular equation or this particular 
okay this particular equation as a part of like time and input size then what do we see is nothing but if you see this equation 4 and plus 5 it's nothing but a linear equation and if when n equals to 0 it's gonna start at 5 and it's gonna be a straight line so this is nothing but the time increases linearly as the value of n keeps increasing or as the input size increases so as the input size increases the time increases right now similarly I will tell you that the time for finding the sum of matrix okay so before that if you actually compare this 4n plus 5 equation right if you compare this equation with something called as ax plus b then we can actually tell that the growth is linear as we already understood which is nothing but it is a very famous equation right y equals to mx plus c so it's the equation for the straight line and if we actually compare this 4n plus 5 it is very much similar to this similarly if we actually try to find that sum of matrix then the equation will look like or will be of the form a n square plus b n plus c now this is nothing but a quadratic equation We don't need to actually get into that much of mathematics but uh, if you understand all of this then when we jump on to asymptotic notations uh, it will be much more easier to understand why we are you know doing all of this or why when we talk about so many asymptotic notations big O n square this and that why we are actually you know doing and what does it actually means so just bear with me and uh, try to understand you know and uh, all of this mathematics might not be even required data so the time taken for the sum of matrix is nothing but a n square plus b n plus c of this particular form so if we actually try to plot this particular sum of matrix in the same graph then if if you guys know the uh, curve for the quadratic equation then it's going to look something like this this is going to be t sum of matrix this is going to be t sum of the numbers in that array and similarly as we saw previously the uh, growth for finding the for or for adding two numbers was constant right but in this case the uh, growth for finding the sum of numbers is linear on the other hand for finding the sum of the matrix is actually quadratic right now to represent this growth of time right to represent this growth of time we will be using some notations and those notations are actually called as asymptotic notations so to represent yes to represent represent this growth we will be using some notations which are nothing but asymptotic notations and the asymptotic notations that we will be talking about are something like big O, theta and omega now we will not get uh, too much into the mathematical depth of asymptotes and curves but for reference uh, let's talk about what is an asymptote yeah so let's talk about what is an asymptote so asymptote is again another curve uh, which basically is a line and which actually approaches the curve but doesn't meet the curve at any infinite distance so let's say if I actually draw a curve here and let's say if uh, we have a curve let's say our algorithm or uh, we are trying to represent the time uh, in, in the time and input size graph our algorithm in the time taken let's say somewhat like this then an asymptote to this curve is nothing but another curve which actually approaches this curve but never meets at any infinite distance 
it approaches this curve but it never meets at any infinite distance then this blue line here is nothing but an asymptote okay now to analyze the algorithms we need to see that for some inputs the algorithm might take less time and for some inputs it might take actually longer time that means we need to analyze the algorithms we need to analyze the algorithms for best case average case and worst case and now let's see how do we do this let's start off with something called as big O notation which is nothing but big O big O notation Now this notation gives us the tight upper bound, tight upper bound of the algorithm. Now let's say we have an algorithm which takes 5 n square plus 2 n plus 1 unit of time. Now since this phi n square plus 2n plus 1, it is a function of n, we can also write it as f of n equals to this, right? Now, if the value of n equals to 0, then we can say that f of 0 is going to be phi 0 square plus 2 into 0 plus 1, which is going to be 1. And let's say for n equals to 1, it's going to be f of 1, which is going to be phi 1 square is 2 into 1 plus 1 which is gonna be 8. Now we need to find a particular function such that it should be greater than or equal to f of n. As we are talking about a tight upper bound then that particular function has to be greater than or equal to f of n. Now if we see that if for any value n equals to 1 in this case we have the value of f of 1 as 8 and if we keep increasing the value of n then we will have multiple values but if we have a function which is nothing but 8 into n square then if we actually try to put any value for n starting with from 1 let's say n equals to 1 or n equals to 2 then I can assure you that this 8 n square is gonna be a curve which will be greater than or equal to f of n you can try uh, with multiple values and compare this equation f of n which is nothing but phi n square plus 2n plus 1 and this particular curve is always going to be an upper bound to this curve. Now if we actually see this then we can write it th this as 8 into n square as another function which is nothing but let's say g of n. Now let's try to define what is the big O notation. So, the big O notation says that big O of g of n is nothing but for an f of n there exist constant c and n naught such that f of n is going to be less than or equal to c into g of n for n greater than n naught. n naught is nothing but n of 0 for n equals to 0. Right? So, we are defining big O as a function of g of n. So, in this case, the g of n is nothing but n square. Therefore, this particular for this particular equation, the time complexity is nothing but big O of g of n which is nothing but n square. So, it is big O of n square. Now, also if we try to plot the graph here, against time and input size then we know that this phi n square plus 2n plus 1 is a quadratic equation so its curve is going to look something like this and we have come up with an equation which is 8n square so obviously for n equals to 0 it's going to start from origin but 
after n equals to 0, after starting with n equals to 1, it's gonna be the tight upper bound to this equation, which will always be greater than this particular curve. So this black curve is nothing but f of n and this blue curve is gonna be c into g of n or we can say g of n, right, which is the tight upper bound in this case. So we'll not get much into uh, more mathematics, but uh, we can all only, you know, we can all, always understand that the tight upper bound here represents nothing but the worst case time complexity for an algorithm of the algorithm. This is what we are interested in. Begon notation represents worst case time complexity and it is the tight upper bound. Now we'll see the other notations and obviously we'll not get into much more mathematics as it's not gonna be that relevant later and uh, uh, I mean like it's not, we are not gonna get into much more details of it, yeah. Next is nothing but omega notation. Now the omega notation is nothing but the best case complexity. Best case complexity or we can say the tight lower bound. Tight lower bound to f of n. Now basically this is nothing but the least growth. This is nothing but the least growth that we will have for sure for a g of n. Now, if we again try to define this in, in terms of equation that, in terms of equation then, it's gonna be 0 less than equals to, we are gonna have a g of n and a constant c such that it's always gonna be less than f of n, which is nothing but the tight lower bound. And if we try to actually plot this against time and input size again, just like previously, then we know that for the similar curve previously, let's say we have a quadratic equation, then this g of n is gonna be the tight lower bound. It's gonna be the tight lower bound to the curve, which will never exceed this. So this is let's say f of n, and this is let's say g of n. Now similarly, we'll jump on to something called as theta notation. Theta theta notation. Now theta notation is nothing but the average case, average case complexity and it's gonna be a tight bound, tight bound or you can say the average running time is always gonna be between the lower and the upper bound, right? The average running time of algorithm is always between lower and upper bound. Again, if we try to define this in terms of equation, then we are going to have one constant c1 into g of n such that is going to be less than or equal to f of n and similarly we are going to have another constant c2 into g of n such that is going to be greater than or equal to f of n. And if we try to define this particular curve or plot this curve against time and input size, then if our f of n is something like this, then our, then our C1 G of N is gonna be let's say here, C of, C1 G of N and we'll have one more C2 G of N which is gonna be an upper bound and this theta will actually give us the average complexity between these two bounds. That is nothing but theta of g of n, which is nothing but the average time complexity, average case, case complexity. 
generally when we compare algorithms we usually talk about the worst case complexity hence most of the times you must have heard that people tend to talk about the big o notation a lot because we always try to compare big o not i mean the worst case complexity for algorithms now if i actually give an example uh, for which the big o notation and the omega and the theta these all three might vary for an algorithm so let's take an example for which all of these three might vary right or maybe not all three but at least the two of them will vary let's talk about insertion sort now insertion sort is an example for which which takes big o of n square time it is nothing but the worst case right in worst case it takes big o of n square times and it takes omega of n which is nothing but the best case complexity which is when the input is already sorted which is input is already sorted and in case i mean most of the cases whenever we have some random input in terms of like having an average case complexity it's nothing but still theta of n square so we have theta of n square average case complexity so this was an example to understand that omega big o and theta notations can have different uh, functions right and different uh, complexities right it can have a different best case complexity different worst case complexity and different average case complexity so this was all about guys like how to compare various algorithms and how and what you know is the asymptotic notation is all about and why we actually need asymptotic notation and we have three asymptotic notations big o notation theta notation and omega notation in the next video we'll be looking into calculating the time complexities of multiple code snippets uh, once you actually go through that i can assure you that you will be able to find the time complexities of any algorithms that you are going to write maybe in your career or whenever i mean like you are going to be able to calculate very easily the time complexities of those algorithms so stay tuned and do watch the next video thank you